Hi, I'm Kevin Judah, along with Afshin Banab, Vincent Charles, and Chris Jerry. Welcome to this week's edition of the Nation's Capital Sports Show here on Arlington Independent Media, Comcast 69 and Files 38, where it's always on. Gentlemen, let's get started talking about what we enjoy talking about the best and the most, and that is sports. This is actually going to be an all-basketball show. So we're going to talk NCAA play locally and nationally, talk about March Madness. But first, let's talk about those Washington Wizards. We know how they're doing nowadays, but that's not the issue. That's not the question. We have a lot of emails that were from our podcast, from our fans who listen to us on the Stitcher Radio Network at Stitcher.com. And one of the questions that they had for you guys is Bradley Bill a better skill player than John Wall. And first, I think we'll start with the man that always has a lot to say, Mr. Chris Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Come to me. Well, what can I say? Um, is he a better player? I, you know what? I think Bradley Beal right now, as a young guy, is better at what he does than what Wall should be doing. Bradley Beal is a scoring guard. John Wall is the point guard. And I think in his very... Brief career so far, Bradley Beal has shown that he can be a really good shooting guard. John Wall is still, to show me anyway, for what it's worth, that he's going to be a lead point guard, Afshin. Well, the good thing about this, Afshin, is that you can't take anything from, away from John Wall because he does bring it. He may not score effectively, and that's obviously something that he needs to work on, Chris. We, we can both agree with that, can't we? But with right. John Wall, his assist, I mean, he, he distributes the ball in other ways. He's a good distributor of the ball. He's really fast. One thing he doesn't do well, at least right now, and maybe it is because he is still so young, unlike Bradley Beal, is he cannot score. And even he's, though he's a point guard, he's got to be able to score inside of 15 feet. He has a problem doing that, and he also has a problem finishing. But I do have to admit, since he's been back from that injury, the team has done a lot better with him handling the point guard. Let's talk in terms of Martell Webster and Trevor Ariza. They've been actually playing an inspiring play for the Wizards as of late, Chris. Yeah, Webster's played well. I mean, you know, he's a young guy and he's, he's doing okay. You know, Ariza, you know, Kevin, I, I don't buy the, the Ariza stock. The guy's been around for a while. He's with the Lakers when they won a championship, got traded. I mean, he's a nice piece, but uh, I don't think he's all that really. All right, well. So and so, you don't think he's been doing any inspired play as for the Wizards as of lately? Well, I think if we look at 15 the, points in one game, 12 at, points in the other. Yeah, but I know you're looking know. at his whole career in, in, uh, in general. But 15, that's true. 15-1, yeah. 12 one, did not play in another <laughs> and all that. I mean, it, you know, that's really, in a way, the, the, it's, it's the mark of this team. You know, we know uh, during our podcast or whatever we've talked about, there's, there's games where We've talked about three or four Wizards. Man, they're great. They figured it out, and then all of a sudden they're on the bench. It's like, what happened? They were so good a few weeks ago. It seems to be working with these two guys, okay? First, Ariza was starting, right? Now Webster's starting. But they're still both playing fairly well. The team is doing better. So go with what seems to be working. Well, at least we know this year the team probably won't be in the bid for the lottery, right? I don't know. Well, they probably will be in the well, lottery I'm somewhere, <laughs> but they may not have a top three or four pick, Kevin. Right. Right. They probably go. will be. Actually, their next five or six games, looking at their schedule, quite <laughs> easy. So they might really start surprising some, some uh, start, start surprising the NBA, and you'll start seeing their record getting a little bit better, but there will be a lottery pick. All right, let's move on to what we really want to talk about. Of course, we're talking about basketball here on the Nation's Capital Sports Show, where it's most definitely on the award-winning Stitcher Radio Network at Stitcher.com. All right, NCAA basketball. We know that uh, Selection Sunday is one week away. We're going to live for that. But locally, let's talk about what happened here in the Washington, D.C., Metro Virginia area this weekend. And we're going to talk, start talking about the Georgetown Hoyas, who delivered a beatdown of epic proportions over the Syracuse Orangemen, 61 to 39. Not a good way to go out in your final <laughs> Big East game. A classic match is That's what everybody right. thought it would be. And they smothered them defensive-wise, and they kept up the good scoring. And they were hitting from the outside early on for, uh, from beyond three-point three point range. And uh, they just never let Syracuse in the game. They dominated that game. And one of the things about this Verizon Center game, it was uh, attended by 20,934 basketball souls, the biggest crowd ever to watch a college basketball game. Chris? You know, I thought that that was – uh, a beat down and I, I I so loved what Thompson John Thompson senior and John Thompson junior the dad said because at the start of this this 
rivalry. They, uh, Georgetown went and won the last game ever at Manly Fieldhouse at Syracuse University, and John Thompson cracked that Manly Fieldhouse is officially closed. And so after this game, you know, having beat Syracuse, you know, they said, hey, we, were, we won the first Big East game uh, uh, last at Manly, and the last Big East game with Syracuse we won. So that was good for them. That's good stuff. And yeah. even more telling about Georgetown University, the Hoyas, is that now they are the Big East Conference champs, Vincent. And that's pretty good. They have a feather on their cap. And, of course, next week, or this week, I should say, uh, it's the Big East Tournament. And you got to like what you see. I do. And Georgetown looks really good going into the tournament. Uh, getting back to that game, I didn't s see that uh, Jim Beheim and Syracuse would collapse like they did. But Otto Porter Jr., he's got the Hoyas on a roll, and they're looking good going into the tournament. That's right. And what I'm going to paraphrase what uh, head coach John Thompson Jr. said, he said that he's going to savor this win because of the historic significance. It's the last game w between them and their rivalry of Syracuse, the Orange Men. Yeah, one of the biggest rivalries in Big East history when this thing started over 30 years ago. They were really two strong teams that went at it. One of my most memorable moments was Michael Jackson was a freshman at the Carrier Dome for Georgetown, and he put up 31 points. You talk about quotes at the end of that game in the presser. I don't remember if it was John Thompson or if it was Michael Jackson, but they were both sitting there together, and one of them said 31 points, one point for every 1,000 people at the Carrier Dome. I'll never forget that. It was one of the great, great uh, games that somebody put up at the Carrier Dome. And the good thing about this is now we have the burning question for you guys. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> well, can the Georgia Hoyas uh, be the number one seed without uh, winning the Big East Tournament? And I think first we're going to start with Vincent. I never start with Vincent first, but Go I need ahead. to start with Vincent. Go ahead, Vincent. Please. They've had such a good year. Of course, if they win it, you know, they're a number one seed, but uh, I think that uh, without winning it, no, they won't be the number one seed. Yeah, it'll, be, it'll be harder to be the number one seed without winning it, but it also depends on what the other teams and the other conferences do, such as Duke, such as uh, you know, uh, Indiana, and maybe even Michigan up in the Big Ten. It depends on what those teams do as well in their conference tournaments, but to guarantee it just about win the Big East tournament and you get a number one seed, I think. Chris? Yeah, I'm in agreement with both Vincent and Afshin. I think if Georgetown wins it, they'll get a number one seed. But your question was if they didn't win it. And I think if they didn't win it, I don't see them getting a number one seed unless everybody else that's been a conference champion and who we have in a spot for number one right now, we're projecting teams like Duke, for example, Indiana. Uh, if they don't win their conference tournaments and say lose in the first or second round, that's maybe. what I just say. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. I agree. Yeah, yeah. So agree. it's nice that uh, you all three we agree. agree. Well, we, we all agree. That's right. Yes. <laughs> all right. If you're just joining us, of course, you're watching the nation's capital sports show right here at AIM, and that is Comcast 69 and Files 38. And you also can listen to us the audio portion of the show on the award-winning Stitcher Radio Network at StitcherRadio.com or Stitcher.com, one of the two. So, let's go on to that Maryland game. <coughs> Choke sandwich <coughs> time. I, 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 I'm, I mean, gentlemen, how can you lead by 17 points, you get into overtime, and you lose that game, and you lose it in grand tradition? I mean, this, the final score, of course, was 61 to 58. And, of course, uh, Virginia won that game. And some of us at this table are diehard Cavalier fans. And so, your team won it, Chris. It's a beautiful thing, <laughs> uh, you know, to, uh, you know, anytime we can get a win over the twerps, it's all good. <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll admit something to you guys right here that you don't know. I was watching that game early, and sometimes when I watch, I feel like I'm a jinx. So I watched that game early, and when the score was like, I don't know, 20 to 8 or something, they were getting killed. I just said, forget it. I'm not going to watch this fool. And Tony Bennett, you're an idiot. You have cost the team. <laughs> They're not even going to get to the NIT now. So Maryland has to win the ACC tournament outright. And uh, otherwise, they might not even make the NIT. And I don't know about Virginia, if you think they might make the NCAA tournament, depending on how far they go in their own tournament. But Maryland can't do it unless they win the whole thing. All right, Vincent. These defensive letdowns, we've seen this before from Maryland. 
And for Maryland to start out uh, with a 13-game winning streak, I just think at the beginning of the year, they had a false sense of security playing all those weak teams. Their chances of going to the NCAA or NIT, slim to none. Well, you, got, you guys have answered my question because that was one of the questions that Af Sheen wrote down, and he said he wasn't going to answer it, but yet he answered the whole question that he gave me. And so the, we know the answer to your question, but I figure I'm going to share it with our listeners anyway mm -hmm. and our viewers. And the question was, does Maryland have to win the ACC tournament to get into the big dance? And the answer, Vincent said yes. Afshin said yes to his own question that he said he wasn't going to answer. Chris didn't know about the question, but then again, doing pre-show planning, he knew about that. <laughs> but I digress. We know how you guys feel. All right, let's go over to the George Mason game. How can you lead by 24 points and lose a game to Northwestern? And that score was Northwestern 69, George Mason 67. George Mason, obviously, is not going anywhere, and they got tossed out of the CAA semi semifinals uh, tournament. Absolutely. Much like you, Chris, with the Maryland-Virginia game, I saw that first half, and I just turned it off. I thought it was over. <laughs> <laughs> but lo and behold, there were a couple big plays, and coaches, the coach for Northeastern made a huge decision in there that got his team back in it against George Mason. And I thought George Mason would beat Northeastern because Northeastern, first of all, at home, had a 500 record this year, mm -hmm. so they weren't a very good regular season champion. But I really thought that game was done. Well, the thing is, um, I, you know, like you, I watched that game, and it was 31 to seven George Mason, and the coach did at the time. Well, actually, I guess it was 20, 30 to seven. The coach did what I thought was a boneheaded move. He saw George Mason make a basket, and then his team took the ball out, said something to the referee, and got a technical. And in college basketball, unlike the pros, in college when you get a technical, not only does the team get the free throws, they get the ball back. So I thought, like, you know, you just got a technical. Now you've given George Mason the ball back. They scored one point, 31 to 7. From that point, Kevin, 31 to 7 with about four minutes left in the first half. After that technical, Northeastern went on a 21 to nothing run. Yeah, when I saw that, I couldn't believe it. I and like, got back Whoa. in the game. And, uh, you know, I, it's funny. I know it's, it's got to be tough for George Mason fans because – you see Jim Laranega leave George Mason in two years. He goes to Miami. They win the ACC regular season. You bring Paul Hewitt in here from Georgia Tech where he had gotten fired after never getting 500 in ACC. You bring him in, give him control of a program that's been pretty good that Laranega had got there where they're always in contention to win the, the conference and get a bid and now they fall on their face like that. Absolutely. Remember, George Mason was just six, seven years ago in the Final Four. 2006. Yeah. You know? yeah. 2006, they were right. in the Final Four, and, and now look what happened to them this year. They should not have lost that game. Most coaches would never have let their teams uh, lose the way that George Mason lost, being up by so many points early in the game like that. And that technical, I guess, put a fire under Northeastern's right. feet. That's right. It kind of changed the momentum, reverse-wise, Vincent. Hard to believe they could lose a lead like that, but with an 18-14 and 14 record, it doesn't look like uh, George Mason's going anywhere. Playing in the CAA, it's not just the Big East or the Big Ten. They're staying home. All right, we're going to let Vincent have the last one on that, but first, actually, we're going to talk about the Big East alignment. Uh, through the rumor mill, uh, this could be a possibility of, of uh, certain teams being uh, in the Big East, Chris. Well, what's happened now, Kevin, is um, the Big East as constructed right now, has made a deal with the so-called Catholic Seven. That's the Catholic schools currently in the Big East that don't play major Division I football. They made a decision to let the schools leave, keep the Big East name, and also continue to play the tournament at Madison Square Garden. So uh, the story is that the Catholic Seven that have left the Big East will form their own league starting on July 1st, and they will probably invite Creighton, Xavier, and it's one Butler. other school, and Butler mm -hmm. from, from the A-10, A-10 schools to come over and, and play and be a 10-team league. And then the following year, they will probably expand two more to go to 12. I think this is good for the new Big East because they were founded as a basketball league made up primarily of private schools. When they first started out, University of Connecticut was the only state school, and then later Pittsburgh joined. But I think this is a good move for the Big East, and I think Georgetown, Villanova probably, we're talking at the top of the show about 
Georgetown and Syracuse being the big, big East rival. I think what's going to happen now is Georgetown and probably Villanova or St. John's. That will be the new big rival and the new big East. It's going to be interesting to see how this works out between in, in the, for the new big East, quote unquote. I like it. It's the new big East, but it's kind of all where it began. And it's back where it was over 30 years ago, where it was just strictly a basketball conference with these great schools and great institutions that will be a part of it and with the addition of some of the teams that Chris mentioned as well. And we want to remind everyone that you're watching the nation's capital sports show on Arlington Independent Media or AIM on Comcast 69 and Files 38. Our email address is tncsportshow at gmail.com. Vincent. Well, I think that realignment will be fine. I'm wondering, um, does VCU have any, uh, any input on any of these uh, new conferences? Well, the talk is VCU has not been extended an invitation, and, and I don't think they will be because, you know, we talked about the Catholic Seven. VCU really doesn't fit the profile of what they're looking for in the new Big East because it's basically a big state school with 30,000 students, whereas most of these schools are Catholic schools. The one school so far that's been talked to go to this new league that's not Catholic is Butler. Um, so I, I don't think VCU would, but to stay close there, Richmond, the University of Richmond could. All right, we're going to let you end it on that one. Vincent asked a question, doing a pre-planning. The questions. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't follow anything today, man. I tell you. Good yeah, gracious. On the spot. Good <laughs> gracious. Oh, man. Anyway, I digress. And give Vincent a hard time. We all, we all give each other the, a hard time here at the Nation's Capital Sports Show. We've been doing this for a while, so uh, no one's feelings are hurt. Uh, let's talk about what we really want to talk about, and that is nationally, the NCAA, the Big Dance Baby Selection Sunday coming up. And every year for the past three and a half years that we've done the podcast version of the Nation's Capital Sports Show, we get tons of emails of rabbit, uh, from rabbit basketball fans, the, the casual basketball fan, and from the sophisticated basketball fan. But basically these questions, all of them came from the casual basketball fan. And they want to know basically... What is the selection committee? What do they do? How are teams selected? First, we're going to let you handle one part of it, and then Chris is going to handle the other right. part. Afshin. Just the framework of it. There's 68 teams that make the tournament. 31 get an automatic bid. That's through their conference championships. As we've mentioned, the Big East champion conference will tr uh, tournament, the Big Ten, the SEC, so forth and so on. The remaining 37 teams uh, rely on the NCAA selection committee to award them what's called an at-large bid. Now that takes place on Selection Sunday, which where the brackets and seeds will be released to the public so you'll know every team that's in it. The selection committee is made up of 10 members, mostly uh, commissioners from uh, the conferences and some athletic directors. That's a framework of how they decide what teams get into the uh, NCAA tournament, but they rely on a whole lot of criteria to decide what teams actually go. And so when they do this, Chris, from my understanding that uh, you have the selection committee's uh, members they belong to different uh, divisions of the NCAA, but they don't choose teams from their division. Could you elaborate well, on they, that? They, or, uh, all, all of them are, are they're affiliated with Division I conferences, oh, but right. what happens is when they're in the room and they're discussing certain teams, the, if their team is in this discussion, let's say if I use Virginia as an example, if Craig Littlepage was in the room and they're talking about whether Virginia is going to be in or not, Littlepage is asked to leave the room. They're not going to discuss him while they're in there. So that's pretty much how they go. And uh, as Afshin said with the 31 bids, you know, interestingly enough, um, for those who say they should open up to everybody, they, the tournament really in a way is open up to just about everybody because the conference champion of these tournaments are the ones that get into the tournament. Only one league, the smart boys, the yep, Ivy yeah, Leaguers, they're, they're the only season. ones whose regular season yep. champion goes in because they do not play yeah. a conference tournament. And now, this year it's Harvard. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, some may say that this uh, selection process is not entirely scientific, nor is, it sci uh, nor is it fair at times. Vincent? I think it's about as fair as it can be. I think putting the uh, conference champs in first, I think that's a good idea. And uh, the at-large, they look at a lot of different things. So uh, I think it's pretty fair. Well, how do we talk to those individuals, our listeners, that say that it's not fair? That's what I was trying to get him to answer. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I mean, it, it's, it's really hard to pick these kinds of teams, 68 teams. And, and there's always going to be a 69th team and their fans that are going to be upset because they didn't get in. But it is as fair as it can be 
at least with this at this juncture, they go by strength of schedule, they go by RPI index, you're out of conference uh, games that you play at the beginning of the season. All these things they fa they factor in in determining who gets in to where. And by the way, Chris, I don't know if Virginia would ever, will be discussed in the selection <laughs> committee. I'm just saying. I'm not saying. <laughs> I got I'm you. Just <laughs> well, you know what? To, to the point that you guys made, you know, to 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 the emailers or anybody else that says it's not fair that these teams are in, get over yourself. At the end of the day. <laughs> At the end of the day, I don't want to hear about teams that play in big conferences that had 10 and 11 and 12 losses complaining that they didn't get in. You got a chance. You should have won your regular season and got a higher placing in your conference. And if you didn't do that, you were given a second chance. You were given a second chance to win your conference and get all in. You know, what bothers me is some of these teams that get out and complain because they should be on 10 11. They want to complain because schools, you know, like we just had Liberty University of Lynchburg, they got in with 20 losses. But you know what? Four straight days, they won a game in their yep. conference tournament. They won their tournament from the Big South and they deserve to go. And Vincent, I know you were pulling for You feel good about Liberty Flames, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, I don't believe in rewarding mediocrity 20 losses but they hey, won their tournament i know they won their tournament and I, I was just saying this is fair right okay but there's a case there well I it's don't, not really <laughs> fair right i don't particularly there you go agree with all right so i, I like i like vincent's uh, <laughs> uh answer there. that's a good one man especially against this guy right here you, and like you, chris was saying you know these teams that are just barely above 500 to reward mediocrity no I don't go with that. And I, I think um, using computer-generated um, analysis, I think it's fair. Well, you can use computer-generated analysis all you want, but the bottom line is with everyone almost getting into the tournament, there's not much computer analysis you can use. I mean, either a team's going to do good in the season and then they're going to win the tournament. And so we do have some division among you guys in terms of what's, what is fair and what is not fair. i tell you one thing, though. Let's talk about uh, national teams. Let's talk about the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Is this the year that this number one rated team will finally make it to the final four? And first, we'll start with you, Afshin. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I think that they may advance past the Sweet 16 for the first time in quite a while, but I just don't see them getting into the final four this year. I, I could be wrong, and Gonzaga is the number one team in the nation for the first time. All right, no. We're, we're going to start with Vincent so he can't say he agree with Chris. We'll go ahead. <laughs> Chris can agree with me. That's right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I think they're capable of big eight play, you know, in, in the uh, elite eight play. Um, but there are so many good teams. Uh, I'd be surprised if they get in the elite eight. They have a chance, but not the final four. I agree with you. Vincent, I agree, with you with me. <laughs> I agree with you in that I think they could get to the final eight. I will disagree with you when you say there are so many good teams. I think there are so many mediocre teams, and I think that's, that's one of the problems. Yeah. But I think Gonzaga, they will probably get a number one seed, assuming they beat St. Mary's in their conference tournament. They'll be a number one seed. They'll probably stay out west, and maybe they'll have a little bit easier path to get to the final four. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. They'll have an easier path if they are the number one seed. But the, in this world of mediocrity that we live in, that's why all these teams, these mediocre teams are in the tournament now, Vincent. I'm but calling mediocrity <laughs> like 18 and 14, something around 500. Chris says a lot of mediocre teams. I don't see 24 and 7, 25 and 7, 26 and 7. That's well, then not mediocrity you've got to go look at, to me. You've got to go look at the records of a lot of these teams that are going to be in the tournament. I think what Chris is also alluding to is that there's, unlike any other year, this year you have literally 15 teams that could win the national championship, whereas in the past you could probably pinpoint two, three, or four teams. You've got more than a handful of teams that actually have a good shot. But they're not 18 and 14. Go look at their records, man. Uh, they're well, not. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Go look at their record. <laughs> and so will I. All right, this is the Nation's Capital Sports Show. We have Chris Jerry, we have Afshin Banab, Vincent Charles, and I'm Kevin Jeter. Uh, the burning question, is this the year of the underdog? Remember George Mason University in 2006, the Butler and VCU in 2011. Is this the year, once again, of the underdog team? I, I don't think so. Not like George Mason where they were a number 11 seed and defeated a number one seed, UConn, in the Elite Eight. I just don't see that happening this year. Like we just alluded to, 10, 15 teams that are really good have a shot to win it, and those are top 20 teams that, that I think should, will make it. Chris. 
You know, it's, it's a what have you done for me lately, and I'll tell you, Duke looks really, really yeah. good the last couple of weeks, and I think they're yes, going to they probably have. win the ACC. If they do, they'll get a number one seed, and any time Duke is in the tournament as a number one seed, you got to like their chances to go to the Final Four. Always. Vincent. Chris, we're forgetting about the <laughs> Miami Hurricanes. Oh, no. Oh. No, we're not. Okay. Right. But I think there's always a chance of, you know, uh, a surprise team up to about the Elite Eight. But like Avsheen, Avsheen says, I don't think you're going to see it in the Final Four. There are just too many good teams. Well, you never know. I mean, especially, what, you know, uh, all it takes, as we've seen many uh, NCAA finals and, and throughout the competition, look at Georgetown last year. They got knocked out. They're a higher seed. It's one and done. It's the team that has the, what is it, the, the momentum right. and, and the school spirit behind them. Oh. And all it takes <laughs> is just one good run where you could be the butler of VCU. Or a Liberty Flames three-point shot at the buzzer to go to round two. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So my next question is, will this be a tournament where the powerhouse teams take over? Remember we, we had one NCAA tournament where everyone expected uh, uh, Duke to do good. Everyone expected Gonzaga to do good. All these top teams, and they weren't even in the Final Four. Afshin. Well, I don't think we'll see four number one seeds in the Final Four. I, I don't believe that. Uh, we might see one or two of them. I do think that some of the teams like Florida and Arizona, they have really good basketball teams that they'll be seated somewhere maybe you know, fifth, sixth, and seventh. They'll be five, six, or seven seed. They have a good shot of making it to the Final Four. I'd love to see what Georgetown does. They have such a good defense. They're young, but they have such a good defense. And I agree with Chris. If Duke gets at number one, man, I don't know. Anything can happen. Vincent. So many good teams. You know, I like Indiana. I like Duke. Uh, but the teams out west, you're right, Afshin. We in the east, we don't hear a lot about uh, our press on, on this side of the country, we don't hear a lot about those teams, and some of those are going to be in the mix. And so the question is, do you think that the Final Four will consist of any powerhouse teams, yes or no? Oh, yes, I do. All right. Chris. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it'll be a couple of them at least in there. All right. Yeah. Well, thank we you, We all agree. Yeah. And we agree. I'm, I'm okay. glad you, you guys are agree, agreeing family. Sympatico. I can feel the love, you know. <laughs> Coming up, more sports. That's right. And we're going to talk about... Uh, a little bit something that's off kelter here. It's not basketball, but it's DC United. This and much, much more on the nation's capital sports show, where it's always on. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to the nation's capital sports show. I'm Kevin Jeter, Chris Jerry, Ashley Benant, Vincent Charles, where it's always on Arlington Independent Media, Comcast 69 and Files 38. Let's talk about DC United. They are one and one. Uh, they lost their first game, Houston to the zero, and then they won their second game, Salt Lake, one to zero. Afshin. Sloppy against Houston. It got better in that game, and it got better against Real Salt Lake. I like what Ben Olsen's doing right now. Chris. I think it was pretty impressive uh, so far to start, given that Dwayne De Rosario was out the first two games because of suspension. He'll be back for the game against the Red Bulls. All right. And, of course, Vincent, we know it was a nice game, right? <laughs> <laughs> Decent so far. <laughs> I like what I see. All right. You like what you see. I'm glad that you do, man. All right. This is the Nation's Capital Sports Show. We want to pay tribute to uh, the many folks that make this show possible behind the scenes. They are the real stars of this show. They, they certainly are. Kevin, Devin Gallagher, Charles Smith, Jonathan Kim, Ken Briley, Steve Cordell, Kimberly Phillip, and of course the pride of Washington Lee, Mr. Craig Seifax <laughs> is right over there behind the camera. All right. So on behalf <laughs> of my esteemed colleagues and friends, Afshin Banab, Vincent Charles and Chris Jerry, I'm Kevin Jeter. We thank you for listening to and watching the nation's capital sports show where it's most definitely on. Have a great week and a great sporting week. Take care. <laughs>